thank you all for coming. This is going to be our, our Passover memorial. And later on, uh, after the communion message, Addie's going to play a, uh, a song on her violin, too. Uh, for the message I'm going to do today for Passover, uh, I actually mistitled it, titled it on the schedule. It's going to be the four prophetic names or titles of Jesus. And uh, we're going to go over four prophetic names of Jesus in the Scriptures. Or actually, more four prophetic titles of Jesus. And uh, there's more than four. There's actually a bunch. There's a lot of different uh, titles of, that Jesus had, the Messiah, the Christ. And we come together today for Passover to remember Him uh, in His fullness, both in the Old Testament and the New. And the, the titles that we're going to go over today are all in the Old Testament. They're all, we see them in the Old Testament, but they're in the New as well, and they all have prophetic meanings. And if you want to go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, that's going to be the first one that we're going to look at. And it's one you're probably all going to be familiar with. It's very common. It's the uh, title Emmanuel, or the name Emmanuel. And uh, we can find that in the New Testament, but it was first mentioned in the Old Testament. And as we celebrate Passover and remember it as a memorial, all these names have meanings. Uh, nothing God did in His Word had... Uh, he just didn't do it just because he, he thought of it that day for no reason or rhyme or anything like that. Everything had a purpose and had a meaning to it that goes back to what we're going to talk about today. But let's turn to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. This is a very common verse. It says here, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call His name Emmanuel. Now, we know that that means, in the Hebrew, God with us. Now, there's some out there that would say that perhaps that it means God with us, but... When Jesus came on the scene, it didn't mean literally that God was with us, but perhaps that He was just with us in a sense or something like that. But that's not really what we find in the meaning of it. It literally means, in the Hebrew, God with us. Now let's turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to look at verse 21. We're going to read through to verse 23. And it says here, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with a child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel which being interpreted is God with us. So here the author of the Gospel of Matthew is clearly going back to Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, speaking of Jesus as this Emmanuel. So the prophecy of Emmanuel in Isaiah chapter 7, the writer of Matthew understands that that's Jesus. And he interprets it as God with us as well. So if you were to ask him who Jesus was, and he's referring back to this passage, what do you think he would say? He would say, Emmanuel, which means God with us. This isn't rocket science. It isn't rocket science. It really isn't. Uh, it's very simple. So, let's now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. To give you more... Testament to Jesus Christ being actually God in the flesh. Not a God, not just a lesser being, not an angel, not a man exalted, but rather God in the flesh. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And it says here, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now I want to just stop there for a minute. You know, there's a lot to understand concerning the Godhead and how God functions as a being. And it is a mystery. We're not going to understand all of it. 
But what has been given to us to understand is clearly that Jesus is God, right? In the flesh. Now, there's the Father as well, and then there's the Holy Spirit. They're God as well, too. And there's lots of different opinions on how to formulate that. But Jesus being God in the flesh is something that is repeatedly taken care of and spoken about in the New Testament. But reading on in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, "...and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh." justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, or the nations, believed on in the world, received up into glory. The Gospel of Mark, let's turn there real quick to chapter 1. The Gospel of Mark chapter 1. And although Mark doesn't use the word Emmanuel, or the name Emmanuel, but we find the same understanding in the first book of Mark, which is interesting because a lot of people that uh, deny the deity of Christ, they often use, say Mark was used, they use the book of Mark often, to say that the book of Mark really isn't used to teach the deity of Jesus, but rather it's kind of absent. Which is funny that they say that because the very first couple verses in the book of Mark tells a different story. Mark chapter 1 verse 1 says this, the beginning of the gospel, or the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, we read that and we understand, okay, speaking of Jesus as Lord, but what we don't often understand, and though I'm not speaking to you all personally, but those that don't read their Old Testament, is the fact that this is a prophecy that Mark is quoting from Malachi chapter 1. And let's turn there. I'm sorry, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And it says here, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Who's speaking here? It's the Father, it's the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh. There's many names that people will go by, but we're speaking of the Father. The God. And He is speaking of His temple. And then this prophecy that the writer of Mark is talking about is referring to the same Lord Jesus as being the way, or excuse me, as John the Baptist preparing the way for this Lord in the Old Testament and in the New Testament it being Jesus. Once again, this isn't hard to understand. And they're one and the same. And I preached an entire series on this not that long ago. But it's, we need to remember it. We need to understand that Jesus was God in the flesh because truly the blood that we're celebrating today that was shed for our sins, if it was of any other man, of any other being, whatever, it would not have sufficed. Uh, it wouldn't have mattered. Now, people will argue with that. Well, are you saying that God died? Well, He died in the being that He was in the flesh. And a lot of times those people will try to put God in a box and say, He can do this, but He can't do that, or He can do this. You see, as we read in 1 Timothy, He manifested Himself in the flesh. He was in our world, in our existence, our universe, however we want to put it. Uh, and that's hard for us to understand because we are in our universe, our world. But God has to be outside of it because He created it, did He not? So we know, without a doubt, if we had asked Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John who Jesus was, they would have said, Emmanuel, which in the Hebrew meant God with us. Very simple. How can God be with us? Well, He was. He was in our, our realm, our, our being, as best as He could. Okay, next title I want to look at of Jesus is the root and the branch. 
Now, that's kind of odd. You know, Jesus, why would He be called the root and the branch? Well, let's turn to Zechariah chapter 3. And we're going to read verse 6 through 8. Because Jesus, the Messiah in the Old Testament, is often referred to as the branch, the root. And there's a very significant meaning to that. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 6 through 8 says this, And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, and this is Joshua the priest, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, and that, then thou shalt judge, oh, excuse me, shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my court. And I will give thee a place to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Well, I mean, that's kind of odd. Jesus called the branch. And we'll find out more here in a minute when we find out this is, in fact, Jesus that we're speaking about. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah ch chapter 53. And we're going to look at verse 1 and 2. It says here, who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now before we make comment on that, let's now turn to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. And then we'll line all this together, how Jesus is the branch and the root. And sometimes in our day and age, you know, the Israelites lived in a very agricultural society, so the Lord had to dumb it down to them a lot of times, and He used a lot of agricultural terms. Sheep, goats, branches, barley, wheat, um, tares, things like that. They, something they would understand. But in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, it says this, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now this word stem here is the same, basically means when you cut down a tree and you have the, the, the root ball or the stump, it's basically the, a very cut close stump. Uh, not a stump, but to cut down almost to the quick. That's what this word here means. And of course, Jesse was the earthly father of David. So we have uh, this is stemming back to the Davidic promise, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 4, verse 2 real quick. And it says here, In that day shall the branch of the Lord... Now I want to stop right there. That's the branch of the Tetragrammaton, the personal name of God there. Just something that we need to recognize in this passage. There's significance to that. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped from Israel. Escaped of Israel. Now, Jesus Christ we know was to come from the Davidic line. He was come from the, the, the genealogy of David. There was very, very important significance to that. And when we read in the first part of Matthew, we won't turn there, but if you read, you know, the first, oh, what is it? Uh, first 16 verses of the very first gospel, what do we read? We read all about his genealogy, which is significant. It's important. And that's why it's so uh, blasphemous when people try to take Ruth and Rahab and other people in, in or not in G, uh, Jesus' genealogy and make them of a forbidden lineage. Because if they were, today what we celebrate never happened. Now a lot of people don't think of it that way, but I mean, how many times have you heard, well, Ruth was a Moabitess of a forbidden lineage. 
Or Rahab the harlot, which she wasn't even the same Rahab. We've discussed that before. Um, if she was, she was several hundred years old. But when we add those in there, what we come to celebrate today doesn't matter because it didn't happen. He wasn't the Messiah. Same thing goes for the law. You know, if he hadn't been circumcised on the eighth day, that blood there was just as important as the blood upon the cross because it was part of the law. If it hadn't been done, it would have been a sin. Just as everything else he did in, the, in uh, his life. It, he was sinless. So, this root, branch, and stem of David, why is that significant? Well, the Messiah was promised to come through the Davidic line. He had to. He was to be of the tribe of Judah from the Davidic line. And that will kind of work into our next title here in a minute, which is David. He's called David. But before we do that, let's turn to Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. Now, as we read this passage, we need to remember that this stem spoken about as the stem of David, or the root of David, or the branch of David, we have to understand that when we read this passage here in a moment, that the Davidic line was gone as far as people could see for hundreds of years. You had King David, you had King Solomon, and then after that, everything fell apart. No one could visibly see a Davidic line for years. The tree had been cut down to the root. There was nothing left except a stump. Nobody could look to that guy. That guy over there is the king of Israel. No, they had been scattered. They had been sent into captivity. They had been lost. So when it refers to the stem of David or the root of David, and we see that it's referring to actually a, a tree cut down to the quick, that's how the house of David appeared for hundreds of years. Then we have Jesus Christ coming on the scene. He is the heir of that. And not just that, but then He fulfills all the prophecies that belong to Him, showing that He was the Messiah. If one of those had been broken, it wouldn't have worked. Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David hath prevailed the, to open the book and to loose the seven seals therein. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, it says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angels, angel to testify unto thee these things in the churches. I am the root of and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. He's saying, I am, as we've seen him say and prove elsewhere in the Gospels, I am that promised Messiah. Just like he was in, when he was in the synagogue reading from Isaiah and he read the passage and he said, this just happened. And they're all amazed and terrified at the same time. The house of David had been cut down to nothing. And just like we've seen around here the past couple years with the hurricane and the other storms, when a tree gets cut down, very seldom does anything come back. But every now and then, you'll even it's usually when you don't want it to happen. <laughs> when you cut the tree down and then you look back six months later and there's a tree coming up out of what you would think would be dead. That's what it's talking about here. The line of David was cut back to where nobody had thought that it would ever come back. But he did. So that goes into our next title, David. David is actually a title. It's a name too, but just like Jesus was referred to as the second Adam, he's also referred to as David. And it's not literally talking about King David. It's talking about the authority of David, the promises he made to David, because God had a special relationship with David. He had the Davidic promise through the Messiah would come through him. And there's promises of the Messiah sitting on the throne of David. And that's not literally talking about a chair, but actually the authority of the house of Israel, the king of Israel. And, you know, oftentimes we, think, we don't think much of David other than he was the little boy that killed Goliath. But he was a very interesting man. He had a lot of struggles. He, had, uh, he was much like us. He had a lot of sins. He was not perfect. 
And uh, you would think if uh, somebody was just writing a story about somebody they wanted to glorify, they'd write a little better about David because he did all kinds of stuff that we would think were absolutely horrible. And God did too. God punished him for a lot of stuff. And um, we read about that and we just sometimes we just glance over it as a story, but there's actually more meaning to it. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. This is a common passage. We're going to look at verse 6 through 7. And as you read this passage, there's going to be a lot of titles given that we're not going to talk about today. But they were titles as well. There's many titles of Jesus. And they all had special meanings. Um, but here in this passage, we see who He was supposed to be. The prophecy it says here, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon His shoulders. And His name shall be called Wonderful. And there's, a, there's a title. Counselor. The Mighty God, or the El Gabor. The Everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. Here, verse 7. And of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end to it. Upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's go ahead and read verse 8 also. And the Lord sent a word unto Jacob, and it hath lightened upon Israel. That word is lightened upon us now. It's sent before us now. He was to sit upon His the throne of David. His father David. He was a descendant. That's very significant. Now let's turn to Hosea chapter 3. And now we're going to read in this passage here how it truly talks about how the throne and the line of David would be desolate for many years. This would be the time between Malachi and... well, actually before Malachi and the New Testament. Now, many people think Jesus is not reigning as king now. I disagree. Uh, we've read it before, but in Acts 17, those Christians believed Jesus was king. That was before 70 A.D. That was um, after His crucifixion. We're not waiting for Him to be king. He's king now. We've understood that. Uh, Hosea chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. And it says here, and I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me, for me many days, and thou shalt not play the harlot, and thou shalt not be for another man. So will I also be for thee. Verse 4, For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a, a, a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek, their, seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and His goodness in the latter days. This isn't speaking of actual literal David. This is speaking of the King David as title. Jesus Christ was to come and be our king. And we know this for a fact because after King David died, who took his throne? His son, Solomon. And then their sons after them. And then the rebellion, and then the uh, scattering, and all that. Well, before that, there was no kingdom. There was no place to say, hey, uh, we're, we're going to have a period of time without a king. No, this is speaking in the future. Speaking of Jesus. So we're not speaking of David literally. Now let's turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 32. Luke chapter 1, verse 32. And we see this being carried over in the New Testament, over and over and over. And another thing too, the house of Israel wasn't really that submissive to the house of David when David was alive as well. I mean, not as much as you would think from reading in the passage in Hosea. It wasn't like there were some glorious days where everybody was compliant. There was sin. Amen. Same thing with uh, Solomon, and, and even worse after that. Luke chapter 1, verse 32. And he shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest. See, there's another title there. That's a whole other title 
in itself. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. See, there's that father David again, going back to the genealogy and how important it is. If Jesus was not from the Davidic line and the Judah line, he would not have been the Messiah. That's significant. Now let's jump down to verse 69 in the same passage. And hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. You remember the passages we just read a little while ago about the servant of the branch, or the branch who was called the servant? Now, let's go all the way back to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34. And I jump around like this because we see by doing this that everything in the New Testament is connected to the Old. Now, a lot of our people like to disconnect it. They like to say that, you know, that, that's the Old Testament God. He was cruel and mean and evil. We have a new God now. But that's not scriptural. Not scriptural at all. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 23 says this, And I will set up one shepherd over them. That's another title we're going to talk about here in a minute. I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David, and he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. Now is God going to resurrect David, literal David, and make him a shepherd over all, the one shepherd? No. Speaking of the authority of David, the authority of the ruling house of Israel. And the servant David was to be Jesus. Now, that moves into our next title, which is Shepherd. And this is very important because Jesus called Himself the Good Shepherd. Now, when I was preparing this message, I started thinking, if, and we'll read here in a minute, actually, why don't you all go ahead and turn to Psalms 23, and I'll make that point. But in Psalms 23, we read that God is our Shepherd. And Jesus calls Himself the Good Shepherd. If God and Jesus are not the same, is Jesus saying that He is better than God? He's the Good Shepherd. Is that implying that God is the bad shepherd? Just a thought. Psalms 23.1 And the Lord, that's His name, is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. It's a very common psalm. We, we pray it often. We learn it as a child. This shepherd here is speaking of the God of the Old Testament. Now, we know here that there is no separation. But I just want to point out, there can't be two shepherds. There's one flock. And I pointed it out before, it's important to know that in the Bible, the term sheep is only used for Israelites. Now that's not to uplift us at all, because I, I've never raised sheep, but the way I understand, they are stupid. They're stupid. Now, I've raised goats, and they're, um, from what I understand, they are not mentioned as... They're mentioned more wickedly, in a wicked sense, symbolically in Scripture. I know why. Uh, they're very intelligent. Now, I've never raised sheep, but they are, uh, from what I understand, they're very stupid. And when He called us His sheep, and um, He's our shepherd, it was not a compliment. I mean, and it's kind of funny thinking about it, because how helpless are we sometimes in our life and in the way of uh, us doing things. It's just, we need a shepherd. We need somebody to dig us out of a ditch when we fall into it because we are not smart enough to not walk into it or fall off the cliff or whatever it may be. Or walk into the jaws of a lion because, oh, what's that over there? We need a shepherd. We're stupid as a people. And for those out there that scream Israelite pride, let me tell you, um, we're stupid. Our God... 
look around. Our, our God found a four-legged animal that is just stupid and compared us to it. Just saying. Yeah, they're cute and fluffy, but... In this passage, we obviously see that the Lord, Yahweh, Jehovah, is the shepherd. He's our shepherd. It's easy to understand. It's very clear. We've read that psalm for thousands of years, and we all understand that. Now let's turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Now we see in this prophecy given here that this is at the time of the Israelites had been taken into captivity by Assyria. And we're all familiar with that history. And then they also give the doom of Jerusalem that it was about to come upon the Israel people. And Isaiah here in this passage offered the people just a little bit of hope for the future. And no matter what you read in the Old Testament, you find that oftentimes, even though there's judgment being driven on the people, the bad things being taught, told about them, there was always some hope for the future. There was always something to glean that God has said, hey, this is coming upon you in the future. Yes, you have been you're misbehaving, you've been disobedient, you're going to get punished, but listen, I have hope for you in the future. Now, there's a lot of doctrines in the land today that people are promoting that do not provide any hope. Just We can just die. Go to heaven. Maybe. You know, it, make a, it turns us in Christianity into a death cult. We're just trying to die best as possible. Now, what happens when you have that mentality? You don't do nothing. You're just trying to survive long enough to get to death so you can go to the pearly gates or wherever you think you're going. But that mentality is not Christian. If we had had that mentality thousands of years ago, none of us would be here. And the Christian mentality is not that. We're to advance the kingdom, not just sit around and try to be as good people as we could. That way I can die and go to heaven. And... There's a lot of prophetic teaching out there that promotes this. Full, full preterism promotes it. Futurism promotes it. And their prophetic interpretations. And the best thing they can hope for is just to die. Well, what does that leave our children when we do nothing for 60 years or 70 years or however long we live? And we leave our children in a worse mess than we, than we had when we got here. And I said it a few weeks ago. That's just a debt we're rolling over the next generation. Jesus didn't teach us that. But, and I, I'm sorry, Isaiah chapter 40. I got off on a tangent there. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 10 through 11. It says here, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and His arm shall rule for Him. Behold, His reward is with Him, and in His work before Him. He shall feed His flock like a shepherd." And he shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Did this not happen when Jesus came? Did he not, as a shepherd, feed his flock? Now think about it. They were lost at that moment in time. Does he not now feed his flock? when we're willing to pay attention. You know, but oftentimes we're too distracted to listen to Jesus when He's actually trying to feed us or tell us something or guide us out of the way. There was a funny little meme going around uh, a couple weeks ago on the Internet that said something about how I feel like when I'm driving down the road and I see a squirrel in the middle of the road and I'm saying, get out of the way, get out of the way, get out of the way. That's me and God's the one telling me to get out of the road. And God often tells us a lot. We just don't listen. We've been trained not to listen over the years. And He does lead us away. He leads us like a shepherd. And that goes into John chapter 10. You want to turn there? We're going to read 1 through 18 because Jesus calls Himself the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. And we're going to 
read through this and, and remember when you're reading it, and I know we all know this here, but there's other people that listen to this elsewhere. This shepherd here is the same shepherd we were reading about in the Old Testament. There's not two shepherds. What did the Lord say? You can't serve two masters? With this mentality that Jesus isn't God, you're serving two masters. You've got the good shepherd, as Jesus calls himself. I guess the other shepherd's bad, right? He's definitely not good. Verse 1 of John chapter 10. This is Jesus speaking. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now remember the term shepherd and sheep. It's about very important. Now notice the sheep of the fold are already in the fold. They're in the door. They're in the fold. They're in the field. That's where they're at. And the one who goes through the door is Jesus. And He is the door. And He's the one that comes in and out. And what He's saying here is if anyone else tries to come in through any way other than Him, they're a liar and a thief. Now today in the world, how many other Jesuses do people promote? For example, uh, and I'm not picking on the, the man, but it, it you know, happened this morning, so I'm going to bring it up. Um, there was a man that sent me a message concerning Mormonism. He was telling me about how he came out of Mormonism, and which is good. Praise God. And he was talking about how good the Mormon church is on things of morality and, and things like that, which is true. They, they have a lot going for them that other people do not. And he made the comment that, you know, they're one of the better Protestant religions or Protestant Christianities. He kept on calling them Christians and Christians and Christians. And they, they talk about Jesus and they know their Bible better than the Baptists down the road. And they know their Bible better than the Assemblies of God and the Pentecostals and things like that, which is probably very true. What's the difference, though? He's a different Jesus. They don't teach the same Jesus in the Scripture. I don't care if they read their Bible or not. They, they teach He was just one God among many. Uh, in fact, for all the religions in the world, Mormonism, just as an example, one of many, they have more gods in their religion than any other religion because it's an infinite amount of gods because anybody can be God. Jesus was a God. One time, Jesus was just a man like you and me, and He, he exalted Himself to Godhood. And His brother was Lucifer. And His, his Father was Heavenly Father. And that's, how they, that's their religion. They, got, they use the same terms with different meanings. It's a different Jesus. The Jehovah Witness Jesus is Michael the Archangel. Not the same Jesus. Now, that's what Jesus is talking about in this passage. If anyone come not through the door, but over the fence is a liar and a thief. So anyone that will come to you and say, preach another Jesus, another gospel... The Apostle Paul told us what to do with that. Does that include rapture Jesus? It does. There's a lot of different Jesus in the world. Let's continue on in verse 3 of John chapter 3. And to, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know His voice. Now I want to stop right here for a second and make a few comments. It's very important for us to remember. The sheep know the shepherd's voice. If Jesus is our shepherd and we're His sheep, we know. Now there's a lot of people that get deceived and they come out of it later in life, but Jesus, the shepherd, leads us. We know His voice. We may have issues with theology and things like that that we have to work out, but we know our shepherd's voice. And we have to be careful not to let these false shepherds come in and go by a different voice and try to deceive the sheep. 
Now, I don't know, like I said before, I don't know much about raising sheep, but I understand, the way I understand, is that they are very um, accustomed to the actual voice of their shepherd. In fact, they will hear their voice and come running, and then if someone else comes in and yells, they, yells for them to come eat, they will not come. And uh, I knew one friend of ours, they lived near some people that owned some sheep, and he didn't use his voice, he used the, his car horn. And his car horn, when he, they heard it honk, that particular car horn, they'd come running. It's the same thing with Jesus. So there's a lot of deception, but Jesus always has a sheep, and we have a shepherd. Verse 5, And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. And they know not the voice of the stranger. This pardon spake Jesus, excuse me, this parable speak unto Jesus, excuse me, again. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. And I love this part. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I'm sure he said this in a real monotone voice, at least that's what I imagine. Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. They weren't listening. He, they didn't get it. You know, how many parables did he tell his disciples and they looking at him and they're like, we have no idea what you just said. I don't understand. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is a hireling, and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catcheth them, and scattereth the sheep. Now, Jesus is our shepherd. But there's also an undertone here of pastors too, because pastors are also known as shepherds for the, the good shepherd. How many pastors do we have today leaving the door open and letting the wolves come in? They do this physically. They do it spiritually. They let false doctrine come in. They propagate it themselves. And they do it for what? A lot of times for their bottom dollar. Filthy lucre, as it says in Timothy. These are not shepherds. They're hirelings. They don't serve the good shepherd. They serve their own will. Verse 13. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. See, he wants us to know this. because Anytime Jesus repeats himself, it's because he wants us to understand. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now I want to stop right there and say that second fold was the house of Israel. The other one was the house of Judah. I've heard all kinds of theories on that one, everything from aliens to Indians, and it's not that complicated. There was a house of Israel. I'm not even joking. Aliens and Indians. <laughs> the Mormons teach there's Indians. It's talking about the Indians in this passage. That's why when Jesus went, uh, he, he resurrected, He went over to the Aztec temple and preached to the Indians. Something like that. Um, but no, it's very simple. It's speaking of the house of Israel, which was scattered, and in our First Peter series, we know that those people were being reached by Peter. That's who Peter was talking to. It was the other fold, and Judah was the other one. And they were to become one. Today, the house of Israel is one. We, I don't know what tribe I'm from. I, you don't know what tribe you're from. Not in that sense like they did. We're one. And that happened after the cross. 
the two sticks were joined. And then the gospel went forth from Palestine, that area of Israel, by people like Paul and Peter and John, and it went, it went west, northwest. Verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. That's what we come in here to remember today. The shepherd laying down his life for the sheep. But, remember, but listen to what Jesus is saying here. This is a testimony of his divinity, his, uh, his deity, excuse me. Verse 18 again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. We can all agree with that. Jesus laid down his life for his sheep. I have power to lay it down. Listen here. And I have power to take it again. He took that back. Now we've talked about that in my Deity of Christ series. But we're talking about God in the flesh, the same God of the Old Testament and the New. And it goes on. This commandment have I received of my Father. We as Christians come together today to remember the shepherd, the good shepherd, the one shepherd that loves his sheep. He loves his sheep because he would lay down his life for his sheep. We are the sheep. We're in the fold. He's the door. We come together to remember all that because we're stupid sheep. We forget. That's why he tells us to remember stuff because we will forget, get distracted. We'll see a butterfly and walk off and get eaten by a lion. That's what sheep do. We're stupid. So we have to constantly remind ourselves of the things that He asked us to, remind, uh, asked us to remember. So, we come here to remember the shepherd that sacrificed his life for the sheep because if He had not, we wouldn't be here today. And if we would be here today, we would not be in the state that we're in. Yes, the world is a terrible place. It has been. It's nothing new. But as it says in the... Sermon on the Mount, we're to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Doesn't say go hide it under a bushel. Doesn't say keep the salt back and don't put it on anything. It's to be used. We're to be a light to those around us. And the problem is in our world today is the sheep don't let their light shine. They just sit back and do their thing. The things sheep do. Eat. Sit around, look stupid, and that's why we need a shepherd. So, let's bow our heads in prayer and let's remember the shepherd who died for the sheep. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You for this time to read Your Word. We thank You for being our shepherd, the good shepherd, the one shepherd that we have, Lord, the one that laid His life down for the sheep. We praise You and we thank You for that, Lord. And if we don't fully understand even a little bit of it, Lord, please help us understand it. In the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names, Amen.